to life. Thank you, music. There we go, and welcome to our first live presentation on YouTube. And it gives me great pleasure, of course, to introduce Professor Mick Cooper, a great friend of counselling tutor and a beer moth, I think, in the world of counselling. <laughs> what, what is a beer moth, Rory? I don't is even it, know what that is. Is that like a big bee or something? It's a big giant presence, Mick. Um, <laughs> That's, that's a beer moth. Beer moth. Um, so we'll just let everybody come in. I'd like to say hello to Mike, Charlie Nage, who is going to be our moderator today. And I'm just going to set that up. I know there'll be a few people coming in. So um, we'll just wait till people come through. And there we go. And Charlie, you're now a moderator. And, uh, and we're, we're really super excited for this um, event because um, I think that one of the big stumbling blocks for students is um, literature reviews and academic writing in general and mix here today to um, tell us about it. So if you are watching live, why don't you put some, um, say hello in the chat, um, tell us how you're going, tell us may maybe where in the world you are, um, tell us where in the world you are. We'd love to know where, where in the world you are, pop that in. I'm based in Mosley, um, which is just east of Manchester, and I am um, I'm, I'm based in the heart of the Industrial Revolution. All around me are the relics of the Industrial Revolution, the mills and the engineering companies that, that made the Industrial Revolution. And Mick, you're in quite a different part of the world, aren't you? <laughs> yeah, I'm in Brighton, which I think you'd say is, what is the heart of liberal... <laughs> <laughs> liberal uh academia and uh but we got a nice pier and it's it's beautiful down in brighton and the it lake, is. which is lovely it is and we're getting people coming in we've got lorraine who says hi from ireland we've got sarah lemon dublin london kildare liverpool east sussex toronto so we're truly international now Mick. that's very good and uh, the south lakes we've got liverpool we mustn't forget liverpool and um not so and not so sunny um, not so sunny. Um, sunny Anywhere? Is it's it. terrible. The rain is absolutely awful down here at the moment. I was just out for a run, but it's miserable. When we got a storm coming in, there's a storm. Yeah, yeah. Oh gosh, well, I'm glad you got in before you got wet. I can I can tell you today that I live in a valley, and the weather across the valley is quite dry. So we're, oh. we're quite dry, and we've got lots of people coming. They're all flowing through the doors now, Mick. We've got Caroline from Manchester. Hello from Edinburgh, Chorley in Lancashire, London, lots of people from London. Um, so I think as people are coming in, um, we'll make a start. Great. So how, how, is going to, how are we going to do it? Mick is going to, pre, is going to present how to do a literature review. And then eventually um, we're going to be um, do some questions and answers. Joe Bartholomew, I'm based in Mosley, which is just east of Manchester City Centre. Hello from York, West Wales. So... We've got um, we've got a lot of people coming in now. Brilliant. So without further ado, Mick, let me kind of um, officially welcome you. Thank you so Thank you. much for doing this. Um, it's so appreciated. And without further ado, what I will do is I will I will kind of yield to you, if you like, <laughs> and remove the pin, and you can share with us how to do a literature review. Thanks, Thank Rory. You, Thanks, Rory. It's lovely to be here. On the, it's such a fantastic site, Cats and Shooter, and all the work that you do. So, Rory asked me to do a session on doing a literature review, and uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, present based on a blog post. I've got a blog, and Rory and the team are going to put the link if you want to follow it on the blog post. Um, on my personal blog, which has a whole load of research pointers around different areas. And one of the areas that I cover it is literature reviews. Uh, and I'll show you a few, I'll share a screen in, in a few places, just where there's some figures or diagrams that I just want to show. The first thing I want to say about literature reviews um, is that, you know, what you're doing 
in a research project, if you're doing a research project, and I'm particularly going to be talking to people who are doing maybe masters or doctoral projects, but also people who are working at graduate level. Um, one of the blog posts that I have is about your research aims or your research questions. And for me, the question that you're asking is the really beating heart of any research project. And wherever you're starting, wherever you're at a research, thinking about what is my question, what am I asking here, is really central to whatever you're doing and trying to be clear about that. Um, not the question, what am I trying to prove? And I'll come back to that because I think making that shift from what am I trying to prove or what am I trying to argue to the question, what am I trying to find out? It's just so important for that research um, process and for the literature review as much as anything else. So being clear about what your research questions are, what you're asking, are you asking, for instance, um, how do people experience empathy in person-centered therapy? Uh, are you asking a question like, what is the theoretical principles of dialectical behavior therapy? But <clears throat> having some sense of the research question that you're asking and being clear about that is the, the core, I think, to research. So that comes on to, I think the first point I wanna make is that when you're thinking about a literature review, it's different from an essay. And a lot of students go into literature review thinking, okay, so this is kind of a bit like an essay and what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna bring together different points to, kind of put forward an argument or a position, for instance, that maybe something like the core conditions are necessary and sufficient. So I wanna make that argument and I'm gonna draw on evidence, maybe talk about clinical evidence, talk about some of the research out there that shows that the core conditions are necessary and sufficient. But when you're doing a literature review, you're doing something different. You're not trying to prove a point. And I think that's a general thing about research, as I was saying before, it's not about trying to prove a point. What you're doing is that you're asking a question and then you're trying to gather together all the evidence that is relevant to that question to answer it in the best way that you can. And in a sense, in the kind of most balanced way that you can. So if you can go into it with an open mind and think, right, here's something that I don't know the answer to. And I think a great place to start when you're thinking about your research question is, what is it that I don't know the answer to, but I'd really like to find out? You know, a lot of the time people go into research thinking, what do I want to prove? But actually a much better starting point is, what is it that I genuinely don't know? And not just kind of like, what am I going to pretend I don't know? But what is it that I genuinely don't know? Like there's so many things we don't know. <clears throat> a lot of my research at the moment is around preferences. And something I don't know, for instance, is what is the best way to talk to clients about preferences. I mean, I've got some ideas about that. I think maybe asking about past therapy might be useful, um, but I genuinely actually don't know what the best way of doing it is. So that's something I could be doing a literature review about. Or, you know, is it helpful to have goals in therapy? I mean, I've written about goals and I've written that goals are helpful, but if I can take a step back from that, and rather than saying, right, I'm gonna write an essay about how goals are helpful in therapy, to say, well, let me review the evidence that is out there, or maybe I'm, it's a theoretical question and the theory is out there and ask a question, what you'd call equipoise. Equipoise is kind of like balance. You know, when we work with clients, a lot of our training is about getting to that point where we don't have a particular agenda. You know, if they're struggling with something, we're not thinking, well, you should do this or you should do that. We genuinely want to be there in an empathic, accepting way, whatever our orientation, to really listen to where the client's at and to help them make their decision based on their best understanding. And research is a bit like that, you know, it's a bit like kind of rather than having an agenda, rather than trying to show something, is about being able to be in that open, balanced, empathic space, empathic with the data, so that we can really kind of engage with what's out there, try and make sense of it, and then try and come up with the best answer. So I might review all the evidence on goals, and I might think, you know what, actually, goals aren't helpful in that therapy, because there's all these studies that are showing this, and there's a few studies that are showing it is helpful, but you know, maybe they're like people like me who believe in goals, so you know, there's, there's biases there. So bringing that data together in, in, a, in, a, in a balanced, open-minded way, I think is really the heart of a, any kind of literature review. And getting that kind of position, that stance, um, is, is, is such an important first step to doing a literature review. So depending on what level you're working at, just thinking about in kind of in terms of the scope of a literature review, something that's really important, whether you're working at level six, seven, or eight, which is 
um, a degree level, master's level, or doctoral level, is that you need to demonstrate a systematic, or perhaps what we might say comprehensive, understanding of a particular field, a systematic understanding of a particular field. And when you get to master's and doctoral level, that really needs to be at the cutting edge of that field. It needs to be what the latest research is, and it needs to be comprehensive. You know, you can't have kind of big gaps in it. You might miss one or two papers. No one's going to be too upset about that, probably. But um, <clears throat> you need to know everything that there is to know in relation to a particular question, everything there is to know in relation to a particular question. Now, if you're listening to that thing, how the hell am I supposed to know everything in relation to a particular question? That might be because the question that you're asking is just too broad. You know, if you've got a question like, um, I don't know, what is the effects of um, psychotherapy? So, so that's your literature view question. There's just millions, well, not millions, thousands of studies out there. Now, for you to be <clears throat> at the leading edge of knowledge in that field and have a kind of systematic understanding of that, it's just not going to happen. I mean, people who spend their years, decades studying that question um you know you're not gonna if you've got say six months or a, a year to do a literature review there's no way that you're going to get to the kind of systematic understanding comprehensive understanding and knowledge in that field so really critical for literature reviews again even in a sense before you got going is thinking about the scope of what you're asking and narrowing it down enough so that you can have that systematic comprehensive understanding. I mean, even a question like what, what's the effectiveness of person-centered therapy? Again, you still got hundreds of studies. Robert Elliott's done a fantastic review of that. You're never going to be an expert on that in um, six months or a year. So you kind of need to think, okay, well, what could I become an expert on? Now, maybe if we were looking at something like the effectiveness of person-centered therapy with people on the autistic spectrum, then maybe if we started looking at the literature, and as I'll talk later, you know, a literature search is very much an iterative process, setting your question, looking at the data, coming back to your questions, looking at the data, finding an approximate scope. But we might look at the studies there and think, well, you know, there's, there's five or six studies that are directly relevant, and there's maybe a few other studies that are kind of in the boundaries. Um, you know, but that's actually a doable area in which I can demonstrate that systematic, comprehensive, leading edge understanding. So playing around with that scope is such an important part of the early stages of doing a literature review in, in terms of finding something that you can really be confident in saying that you have a systematic understanding or, for instance, at masteral or doctoral level that you're a leading expert. And, you know, if you're working at doctoral level, you need to be the leading expert in that area, you know, more than your supervisors, more than other people in the field. And the only way that you can do that is by choosing a, a focused enough area where you can show that depth, that systematicness, that comprehensiveness of it. And, and, and research is about, you know, it's not about trying to cover everything. Because if you try and cover everything, it's inevitably going to be thin. The way that research builds and we all learn from each other is if each of us does little things, but we do it in depth, then we can build up really kind of big understandings and deep understandings all together as a community uh, of particular areas. And, you know, at master and doctoral level, as I was saying, that needs to be particularly at the forefront of a field. So it's about having research which is up to date and which is the latest. I'll come back a bit to how you can do that and uh, how you can make sure that it's a forefront. But if, for instance, you're doing a literature review, and you're finding that your studies are maybe all there in the 1990s or even the early 2000s. There's not much there, say, past the 2010. I mean, there's no specific cutoff point. It's not that you need six references past 2010. But if you're finding that your most of the literature you're reviewing is from a few decades back, then probably something's not quite right there. It may be that you're not finding the most recent studies. It may be that the question you're asking has become a different question for, um, for you know, people who kind of stop asking that question. There might be some quite good reasons for that. But ideally, with a, with a literature review, you're really there at the forefront, even, you know, at degree level, you're at the forefront with the studies in 2020, 2021, you know, the last decade which is showing that you're really kind of on the latest knowledge that is built on everything that's there. 
Something else that's really important about masters and doctoral level is about being critical in your work. And sometimes people under, misunderstand what critical means. You know, critical doesn't mean saying, oh, well, that was rubbish. Sometimes, like, you know, Rory did a study here and, you know, it was a rubbish study and he should have had more participants or, uh, you know, this study here was, was, was only done in the US and it should have been done in the UK. Critical means that you are making sense of what the data is, what you're finding uh, in terms of um, the kind of questions you're asking and what you're going to find out about it. So it might mean, for instance, you know, it might be that you're, you're looking at studies and you're asking a question like, what is clients' experience of empathy? And you're looking at a study and it's a good study, you know, that has a really nice phenomenological rich descriptions of clients' experiences, but maybe all the clients were white that they spoke to. Well, a very valid criticism of that is that it was a it was a select sample. We don't know if this generalizes to people of color of different ethnicities. So that's a good criticism, but we want to frame that in terms, we don't want to just want to say, well, this is a problem with this study, that's a problem with that study. We want to be able to say, well, look, because of this limitation, because every study is going to have a limitation, your study is going to have a limitation. There's not a single study out there without limitations. But what we want to say is because of this limitation, then we might need to bear that in mind in terms of how we interpret and make sense of the data in relation to the questions we're asking. So it's always about going back to the question, thinking, well, given my question, you know, what does this really tell me? You know, there's a small sample size. Again, you don't want to just say, well, it had a small sample. Um, you want to say, well, because it had a small sample size, uh, it means that it's maybe difficult to generalize to wider populations and uh, maybe more studies are needed to look at how this might relate to wider population but it's in the context of the questions that we're asking uh, rather than just criticisms per se i wanted to say something about kind of systematic you know people talk a lot about systematic literature reviews and i think there there is a move these days um, to try and make literature reviews systematic particularly if you're working at um, masters or doctoral level and systematic I mean as far as I know there isn't a specific thing called a systematic literary review it's more a kind of scale of increasing degrees of if you like systematization and systematization means that there's kind of explicit stages uh, which are described in the process so that might be for instance explicit description of your search strategy and I'll come on to that about how you go about searching for literature. So it's not just that you're kind of having a quick look at the literature, maybe a bit on Google Scholar uh, in a few books and then bringing together some references. Systematic would mean that you've kind of set out, ideally before you start doing it, although as I was saying, it's iterative, that you've set out some kind of procedures uh, for how you're going to search for things. And then what kind of analytical strategy you're going to use? Are you going to use, for instance, a thematic analysis? Um, or are you going to do it more as a kind of writing about each study? But I'll come on to that, or perhaps even a meta-analysis. Um, setting out things like eligibility criteria, like what would make a study relevant to include in your literature review? For instance, you might be looking at studies that are just on young people. Uh, or you might look at studies that are just person-centered therapy, but then do you mean person-centered and experiential therapies? Do you just mean classical client-centered therapy? So setting that out, one of the ways that you can do that is through something that's called a, a protocol. Uh, and if you have a look at my blog, there's some examples of a, 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 a protocol and you can use that. And that has headings like kind of aims, eligibility criteria, which is things about, for instance, the, the, how the study was published, what the study was looking at, um, what information sources that you're going to be looking at in terms of finding um, uh, papers, articles for review, uh, how you're going to select papers. So my cat is just trying to get in. I'm just going to let my cat in. It always does that at the most inopportune times. Um, yeah, so you kind of write out a protocol. And I think whatever level you're working at, having some kind of written protocol, uh, which you might then put in an appendix for a literature review, is a really good thing to show that you've done this in a kind of systematic way. Now, there are guidelines. There's something called PRISMA guidelines, uh, which is guidelines for doing systematic reviews. Um, they're particularly for what's called meta-analysis. So meta-analysis are systematic reviews 
but are very much based around the quantitative data and it's a kind of mathematical process for drawing together lots of quantitative data. In the, in the, in the council field, not, not that many people see on counselling courses as students would do that kind of meta-analysis. They're, they're pretty complicated maths, but the PRISMA guidelines are definitely worth looking at just in terms of they set out things like um, selection processes, how you might select papers, how you might assess things like risk of bias. Um, and you can always use some of it and not all of it as a way of making that review more systematic. What I'd say is that at minimum, um, it is useful to say how you search for literature in a particular area. So for instance, as I'll come on to in a minute, what kind of search terms you used um, when you were looking for literature uh, and then maybe did you use citations again that I'll, I'll describe or did you look at, did you contact particular people, for instance, you can set that out in uh, a protocol. Um, but I would describe that in a literature review, you know, when you talk about the method for a literature review, to say something about how you went about doing it, what information databases you searched, what you really want to avoid and what this is all about is you want to avoid communicating that it was kind of ad hoc it was that, it, that, that you weren't cherry picking you know if you're writing an essay and that's the difference with an essay with an essay you might cherry pick certain quotes or or certain examples to illustrate the points you want to make and that's that's you know that's fine for an essay but for a literature review and particularly for a systematic literature review um you want to set out the method first and then follow the method because in a sense what the community wants to know is about what you found. It's like you're a kind of discoverer and you're going out there. And if you've got a particular agenda and you want to show something, then for the rest of us, that's not quite so interesting because, you know, almost inevitably you're going to show what you wanted to find. But if you go out with an open mind and you set out some ways that you're going to go on this journey and the tools that you're going to use, and then you're looking in an open ended way, uh, and then you're telling us also how that you did that. That's so useful for the rest of us uh, and so impressive in terms of the rest of us being able to learn from you about what it is that you found. So I think, you know, at the very least, see if you can set out how you search for literature, what you found and why you can you can help us or your assessors or whoever's reading it understand that it wasn't just about cherry picking the data that suited your argument, that there was uh, more to it than that. Now, in terms of how you want to um, um, kind of go about searching the literature, let me talk a little bit about that. I just want to show you something from the blog. Um, so supposing you were doing something about, about say, um, person-centered therapy, uh, the effectiveness of person-centered therapy with uh, people with autism, the example of that, what you would do um, in using kind of search engines, which could be Google Scholar and probably your university or your institution will have access to ones like PsychInfo is a very good one, Web of Science. You want to start, rather than just putting in those words, you want to work out what the key concepts are. This is an example. The example that you can see here is from a review that we did, a systematic review of um, integration across child mental health services. It was when I was working with um, Children and Young People's IAPT, and we were, were very interested in looking at what factors might facilitate or inhibit communication between different child mental health services. So we wanted to look at all the literature and find out what people were saying was good practice and not so good practice in integrating, say, between CAMs and schools and counselling. So what we did is we set out <clears throat> three main concepts. So one of them was integration. Uh, and then we thought of all the words and we brainstormed um, all the words that might be meaning integration. So you can see there are things like integrate, multi-agency, multi-agent. You can see also there we use something called a star, star which are wild cards. So INTEGR, -E -I -I -E star, for instance, would bring up integrated, integration, integrating, um, rather than having to spell out all those different terms. So there was lots of different words. And generally, when you're doing a search, you can be fairly inclusive. And if it's if you're getting back loads and loads and loads of results, you can look at it and you can think, actually, let's take this word out because it's just bringing up lots of things. You know, like we might use something like um, 
uh, no, coordinated. And then we get lots of studies which have got nothing to do with interagency working at all. And then we think, well, let's take that out. Then we had some terms on children and young people. Uh, and then we had terms on because we wanted it also to be about psychological. So we put all those and we also, in this case, put in the uh, publication year. But whatever you're doing and whatever you know, piece of research where you're searching, starting to search the literature, you know, think about, set it out, maybe use a table, think about, okay, these are the key terms I want it to have. It has to have something about this, and then it has, has to have something about that, and it has to have something about something else, and there might be three or four. You don't want to have too many because it will make it too specific. And then what you do is that you go to the search engine. So you might go to a search engine like um, PsychInfo or um, Web of Science, uh, if you've got access to that for your institution, or you might use something like um, Google Scholar is, is available to all of us. And you would put in, and different search engines have slightly different ways of doing it. You need to have a look at the kind of uh, help information for those search engines. But you would put those terms in and you'd say, right, I want to find all the papers um, that have things about person-centered, person-centered, and you do all the different spellings of it, uh, autism or Asperger's and all the different terms for that outcomes or effectiveness and all the different terms for that and then you would run that search and, and and see what comes out now now a few things one thing you'll know is that i'm talking mainly about research papers and particularly at masters and doctoral level most of literature reviews will be focused on the um the research evidence rather than Carl Rogers in 1957, Freud in 1923, the more kind of theoretical papers. Generally, the questions that are asked, although not always, but generally the questions that are asked tend to be of a kind of empirical kind. So you're kind of focusing more on research papers than you are on uh, books. So what you would do is you'd <clears throat> put those search terms in, in, see what comes up. You might need a librarian to help you do this at your institution or <clears throat> your course should be taking you through this process or there's various instructions online. Now, at that point, what you might find is that you get tens of thousands of hits. You know, um, there might be loads and loads and loads of loads. So what you do is there's a kind of iterative process of moving back and forward between looking at what kind of hits you're getting, changing the terms, maybe narrowing them down, um, trying it again, looking at different hits until you hit a kind of sweet spot. And a sweet spot is probably between about maybe 200 and 2000 something like over 2000 becomes too many just to go through generally although you know some people are okay with that less than 200 uh might be a bit restrictive so you're getting to a point where you can find um a, a kind of a manageable amount of papers articles to go through now importantly in that process and you would have seen if i just show you that um search strategy again um, you'll see that there's also field here and in the search engines like PsychInfo, um, Web of Science, you say, and <clears throat> this is something you might want to report, I mean, you might want to put a table like this in your um, paper, it would be great, or do it as an appendix, but you'll see here also we're searching in different fields. And that can be quite important, like, so the field could be, it, it, it could be that that word has to be in the title, which is very specific, because you've only got like 15 words or so in the title. It might be that it's in the abstract, which is a bit more liberal. It might be in any bit of the text, which is really liberal. But we might start, for instance, with putting in child or adolescent or young person or CAMS in, for instance, the or any text, you know, that that will come back. And then if we find that that, that just gives us too many results, we might narrow that down and say, well, it has to be in the title. And if then we don't get anything, we might go back and say, well, it needs to be in the abstract. And you, you kind of play around and it takes some time to play around with this until you get, as I say, you know, somewhere between about 200, a couple of thousand hits or so. And of course, most of those aren't going to be relevant. A lot of those are going to be, you know, it might talk about person centered, but it might be talking about, I don't know, person centered care in nursing, which actually has nothing to do with what you want to do and typically maybe you know 90 percent of your first set of hits won't actually be relevant so what you'll do is then using the software and you might download it into say bibliographic software like endnote if you've got that or um, different ways of, different ways of doing it. you might do it on the software itself but you would go through then maybe just the titles and have a look at what's relevant and then after you've done that <clears throat> that would then give you um, maybe a smaller number or maybe a hundred or so papers that you would th say, well, those 
based on the title, those look relevant. Uh, and then you would do another screening process where you might uh, read the abstract as well, or you might read the whole text. Um, and then you would narrow it down that way until you get to, I don't know, you want to get to somewhere between probably about 25 and um, six papers, I would say, something like that. You know, that you want your review to, um, um, you know, if you've got less than, say, six papers, five, six papers, then that you've found that are relevant to your um, study, you're going to kind of struggle to have a really comprehensive um, <clears throat> and a kind of rich uh, description of what's going on in relation to your question. You know, maybe five, four, five, six, it depends how much data there is. But generally, you know, if, if it's a really small lump number, like two or three, essentially your reviews just can be repeating what was in the paper. At the top end, mm, you know, you don't want more than maybe 20, 25 the papers that are really central because again that's going to become unmanageable and again there's a kind of iterative process you know if you find for instance you set out your criteria and you find that maybe you got 100 papers that are relevant what you do is you narrow it down maybe you just look at young people or you just look at children or you just look at um focusing rather than person-centered therapy so you move kind of backwards and forwards and so you've got the question that you want to be asking as a manageable way of um answering it um, and then when you've got that, that's when you can then do your systematic review and that you can, once you've completed that kind of search process, uh, you can do uh, and start analysing the data. Now, there are other, as well as using those search engines, there's other things that you might want to do as a way of um, uh, finding papers. One of the things that's a very powerful thing to do is what's called a citation search. And again, let me just show you that. So if you're looking for papers, for instance, on Google Scholar, what you'll see is something that says cited by, or if you're looking on psych info, I think it may just say citations. Now, what citations are is where that paper has been referenced by work subsequent to it. So, you know, when you look at the reference list of a article, uh, it will say all the papers that are referred to in that article. And that can be quite good. You know, if you've got a key article, you might want to go through the references in that article. Um, but citation searches works the other way around it kind of says right given that this paper was published in this case this is one i think 2013 what were the papers that were published after that that cited that and if this is a key paper that's a really helpful way of finding other relevant literature so you can go into that kind of cited by and then that will bring up a whole other list of um papers that may be relevant. What you want to end up with is something that looks a little bit like this by the time you've ended your kind of search procedures. Now, this comes from that paper about child mental health services, and it is very detailed. You probably don't want to do something that detailed, but this is called a study flow chart. And ideally, um, even at graduate level, it would be really helpful, I think, to be able to record and you know whether it's an appendix or in the main lit review the process of how you selected discarded um and ended up with your final sample you know with this one you can see that we started off with over four thousand records that we identified and by the end we got down to 33 which is less than one in 100 and that's not atypical but you can see and what we've detailed here is why we excluded certain papers for instance it wasn't related to young people uh, it wasn't mental health um, you can also see here um, that there were some um, papers that we then looked at the references and then we brought in other papers. And you might do other things, for instance, you might talk to experts in the field as a way of um, uh, um, bringing in more data. Um, so there's a different things you can do. If you're working at doctoral level or if you're working, if you're trying to do something that's publishable, uh, it's also worth thinking about whether you would bring in somebody else to do a kind of independent uh, review. For instance, you might have your hundred or so papers that you've come down to, and then somebody else would read through them and see whether they would select the same amount, uh, select similar ones to you would do, maybe 70 or 80% overlap, um, to show that your selection of papers isn't just a kind of personal idiosyncratic thing um but is actually to do with um <clears throat> uh you know it, it's re re replicable somebody else would come up with something similar 
Something important to say when you do this search strategy, you know, if you know that certain papers are relevant, but they're not coming up in your search strategy, then that means that something isn't quite right with your search strategy and you need to adjust it. You need to look at why it wasn't coming up. Maybe you, were, you there's terms that you haven't included in your search um, strategy that you should be including. What you don't want to do is, a bit difficult to explain this, but what you don't want to do is say, okay, here's my search strategy. I'm just going to look at the things that come up. And if something's relevant, uh, it might be relevant, but it didn't come up in my search strategy, so I'm not going to look at it. That doesn't make sense because you kind of need to do everything that is comprehensive and related to the questions that you are asking. Um, and, um, and, you know, if something's not coming up, then that means that something is not quite right. So in terms of writing up, you know, if you think about the write up now and how you write up a, a literature review, a general point I would make is think about, you know, as you would with any article using or paper using headings, subheadings to make it clear the different sections. That's generally good practice when you're writing. And if you look at my blog, you can see uh, some blogs about kind of tips for writing generally. You probably want to have a short section talking about the method, how you went about doing this. Literally, you might have, you know, typically you might have a bit about the background, something about why the question is important. Uh, maybe some of the general contacts, you know, if it was about child mental health, you might say something about the numbers of young people today uh, and children struggling with mental health problems, you know, so therefore we need to know this, this and this. Then you might say something about, a bit about the method and then you would go into the results. Now, something really important when you write up your results and particularly as you kind of go up the levels, so to master's and doctoral level, is to try and avoid what I think it was John McLeod said, a kind of laundry list way of writing up. I mean, so often people do that and it's, it's, it's not demonstrating so much those kind of master's and doctoral level skills. You know, if you found seven or eight papers that are relevant, you might want to start by saying, okay, you might want to give a table actually is really helpful of the different papers and to say, well, there was this paper, that paper, that paper, that paper, that can be really good just as kind of, it might go in the appendix. But don't make the results of your literature review simply saying, well, so-and-so found this and so-and-so found that and so-and-so found that and so-and-so found that and so-and-so found that. And you know, you can hear it's kind of boring um, but more importantly, it's not showing that you kind of really grasp and have that capacity to synthesize the data. Um, so just kind of laundry listing it or going through a kind of it by day and year, which often people do, uh, is not the best way of presenting the findings. What you want to do is some kind of, you know, unless you're doing a meta-analysis, which as I said, is quite a complex statistical procedure. Probably what you want to do is some kind of thematic review which is where based on the data you've got and critically the questions you're asking you know if you've got lots of questions then it might be that you thematically analyze it in terms of the answers per question that you break it down into kind of different sections that are answering um, different questions or are based around different themes um, so that you're what you're doing is you're again if i just show you on my screen um, what you're doing is that you are integrating the findings from different studies. So, for instance, you might say, you know, if you were doing it in a kind of narrative way, you might say, well, some research has shown this. And then you give the studies that um, say where that's happened. And then you might say, well, but other studies have shown this. And again, you bring together all the studies and then you might say, we know this, we know that. But you can see there that in that structure, what you're doing is you're synthesizing, you're bringing together, you're, you're amalgamating the findings, because that's the work of a literature review. It's not just about praising um, lots and lots of different studies. It's about bringing together some kind of meaningful, coherent story, if you like, about what it is you're finding. And as part of that, you know, it's really important to remember, you don't have to give every study um, equal weight. You know, it might be that, for instance, that there's some of the studies that you find that are really give loads and loads of um, answers to your questions. You might find a study where the whole thing really tells you exactly about people's experiences. Maybe, maybe you know, if you're looking at people's experiences of uh, person centered therapy, you have Asperger's. And maybe there's a, there's a study of people with autism. 
that is really relevant. It's not quite the same thing, but it's really relevant. And there's lots that you want to be able to say about that. But then there might be another study. I don't know. There might be a study about, for instance, you're looking at young people. There might be one with adults, which is kind of relevant. There's one or two bits that are relevant, but most of it actually isn't relevant. And absolutely. So absolutely. You don't want to have a, a result section, which is just saying, okay, well, this study found that and that study found that. And you're giving them each weight because one of these studies is really central to what you did. The other study is actually pretty peripheral. So, you know, take what is relevant. You need to drive, if I can put it like that, you need to drive your write up. You're not, you know, when we think about, and this is maybe where it's a bit different from therapy. And I think sometimes person centered therapists can struggle with this because, you know, with the emphasis on being reflective and non directive, which is totally appropriate in a lot of therapeutic work. But often it's quite kind of wanting just to present what is out there in its natural form and to repeat perhaps or to reflect back what the different researchers have found. But particularly when you talk about master's level, you know, it, it's about you having mastery of this data. Doctoral level is then a step up. So you need to work the data, you need to drive it, you need to use the data to answer your questions, not just reflect the data as it is, you know, and that's not about, you know, going back to that point about equipoise earlier, that's not about having a particular agenda in terms of what you want to show. But it is about having an agenda in terms of what you are asking, you know, being clear about the questions you're asking and using the data that is then out there in a balanced, fair, open, critical way to answer those questions. Now, something else I want to talk about is just about, you know, sometimes a review might be more about the evidence. It might be something like, um, you know, how do you know, like that question about how do people with autism uh, experience person centered therapy is an empirical question. Uh, or you might be doing a more theoretical literature review. It might be, for instance, what is the person centered theory of development? Now, both of those are fine as a literature review. In both cases, I suggest using some kind of systematic search strategy. I think what is really important, and again, perhaps is quite a common pitfall, is where people confuse or kind of mix up what is evidence and what is theory or hypothesis. You know, I mean, it might be Carl Rogers says that certain conditions are necessary and sufficient, but you know, that's Carl Rogers, you know, brilliant man, but you know, that's his viewpoint. A study which shows, for instance, that um, only clients who experienced empathy improved and those who didn't uh, actually didn't improve is of a very different order of things from what Carl Rogers says. So it might be, you know, some studies would be looking at some reviews might be looking at theory and research. And, you know, again, it's fine to do that. But if you do just be really clear, what is it when you're reporting evidence and what you're saying about what we know from the empirical systematic rigorous studies about the data and what is hypothesis uh view and you know again clinical evidence for instance you might have a study where you're drawing clinical evidence where case studies maybe it's not systematic case studies where somebody's writing about working with a client again that's fine if that's the level of evidence that you have and that's what's available but just be clear and you know a, a case study a non-systematic case study is different from say a systematic rigorous piece of qualitative research and you need to be clearer as part of the kind of critical uh, analysis as part of the research. Something else I'd say, which is also another common problem, is that sometimes people mix up reviews and primary studies. So if you're reviewing the, the you know, you're searching for papers, typically what you'll find is that you'll find some primary studies, which is where somebody's gone out and collected data. But you also might find reviews or maybe meta-analysis where somebody has combined together the findings from different studies and then presented that review. Now, generally, when you come across reviews, you want to go back to the primary studies. Most reviews that you'll be doing uh, and that people do are based around primary studies because you're reviewing the evidence that is out there. Um, and that means that, you know, other reviews can be very helpful. You might want to write about them in the, in the introduction, but you don't want to mix up kind of reviews um, with primary studies, reporting on reviews, reporting on primary studies. They're, again, they're very different order of things. Sometimes when people do kind of review systematic reviews, what they actually do is a kind of review of reviews. And that's very legitimate that you look at all the reviews that are out there, say on, I don't know, what works with 
uh, uh, people with learning difficulties, for instance, or um, uh, the effectiveness of person sent therapy. You know, there might be different reviews on that and you want to bring those together. Well, that's fine. And then you do that and then you wouldn't look at the primary studies. But again, don't mix up reviews with primary studies, one or the other. Or if you're going to report on both, just be really clear about reporting on them separately. So we're just coming to the end. I just wanted to say a couple of final things about how you can structure the lit review. And there's one which I kind of call the target approach to thinking about a literature review, which is I've tried to kind of do, do a diagram of it here. And the target approach is kind of, you know, if you think about one of those, what is it, uh, uh, kind of arrow, what are they called arrow targets, where you kind of have the bullseye and then you have something around it and then something around it. So one way of doing it and writing up as part of this kind of thematic analysis or, or version of it would be to say, right, you know, my question was about uh, how do people with uh, autism experience person centered therapy? And there's maybe one or two studies that where people have specifically asked people with autism about their experience person centered therapy. And that's kind of bullseye, that's right on the mark of what we want to know about. And that's great. And we might write about those in depth. And then there might be things around that that are maybe less relevant. Say we just focus on young people and there's a study of maybe adults, which is kind of related, or maybe it's a study of adults where there are, or maybe maybe people with particular gender, or maybe it's from, from a very different culture, uh, or maybe it's something that we think might be related a bit to autism, but is kind of different. And that's kind of around it. And then there might be things around that, like, say people's experiences of person-centered therapy um where you know it might it doesn't directly answer our question but it might give us some clues about how people with autism experience person-centered therapy and that's the kind of outside bit so you know we really focus on the red bit the target and then less so on the outside bit and even less on the outside bit but together it kind of builds up a picture based on kind of what we know most and what we can be most certain about in relation to our research question to what is more kind of peripheral, but still informative knowledge. And then the other way is more of a kind of pyramid approach, where what you would do is you start with kind of a very broad level of this is what we know about the field, and maybe this is what we know about helpfulness, or this is what we mean by experience. And then you kind of narrow it down to talk maybe about young people, and then you would kind of focus maybe on young people uh, with, with autism who, who meet criteria with autism. So you can kind of do it that way as well. I think personally, if I'm honest, I kind of prefer this target approach just because it's more direct. You know, I, going back to this thing, and maybe I'm a little bit pedantic here, but I just think, you know, literature research is about putting out a question and answering it. And I think to, to, to set a question and say, right, this is what we know most certainly in relation to this question based on some really direct knowledge and just going, you know, kind of diving straight into it um, is, is, I think, the most kind of informative approach. And then you can say after that stuff that is more uh, peripheral. So I hope that's helpful. There's, uh, there's some suggestions for further reading on the blog post. Um, but I think just to say, you know, ultimately, a literature review is about gathering together the data in relation to a question you aren't asking. And if you can be open minded and if you can go into it really with an open mind and think, I don't know what the answer to this question is, but I'd really like to find out that it's by far and away the best starting point. And then following some kind of systematic method that allows you to answer that question in a way that is transparent, uh, that's fair, that's balanced, that allows you to be critical, that's not driven by your own particular agenda for an answer but is driven by an agenda to answer a specific question. So Rory, I'm going to stop there. Uh, a little bit over, sorry about that. No problem, Mick. Well, thank you so much um, for that riveting lecture. I'm sure that people are going to get absolutely huge amounts out of it. Why don't you take a, a well-earned drink or just take a, a little bit of a break there? What, what are you saying about me, Rory? I need a drink. <laughs> Well, there you, there, there you have it. You need, you need a drink, Mick. I need a drink. Uh, you need a drink. And uh, and um, what we're going to do now is take some questions. So Great. if you've got any questions, pop them in the chat stream, and we will try to answer them. We've got two already. Um, so uh, without further ado, if you're ready, Mick, I'll ask them. The first question is um, using – let me bring my – let me bring my board up so I make sure I get these questions correct. 
The first question is from uh, Joe Bartholomew, who says, how can I get involved in research studies as a qualified therapist mm. to develop my own practice and eventually teach to improve counselling training and counselling <sighs> services? It's a really tricky one. I mean, this is a more general question, and it's a really tricky one if you're not in the academic system getting involved in research. Um, you know, if you're doing a... The problem is that academics like myself are really, you know, a kind of have really a focus on the kind of teaching and working with the students, master students, doctoral students. If you're outside of that system, um, it's difficult to do research because, you know, you don't have an ethics committee. There are, I mean, one of the things like BACP, for instance, are trying to do and um, practice research networks, which bring together people perhaps on particular orientations to do research around particular uh, questions and collect data. So I think that is one option. Another option realistically is to do a course where you're kind of within the system, because just things like getting access to libraries, if you're not part of an institution, uh, unfortunately, you know, is, is, is really tough. And, you know, things like uh, uh, ResearchGate try and make papers more accessible, but it is very difficult to do research outside of an institution. You know, you can also get in touch with researchers at institutions and see if you can work with them. But, you know, often unless there's funding, it's difficult for people to kind of spread out and disseminate into new research areas. So it's, it's, it's an unfortunate, you know, part of our kind of neoliberal world that everything is driven by finances and it is difficult to do it uh, but the BACP I think and UKCP I think are also trying to take stuff forward okay well, I think that's a very comprehensive answer the next question is from uh Rena Khan Kun I'm sorry I apologize Rena Rena Kun I think that's the way your name's pr pronounced and um, she asks about using um grey literature how much grey yeah. literature is acceptable and could you just outline what grey <laughs> literature is Mick yeah no that's a great question and grey literature is things like theses maybe unpublished papers and manuscripts people have put up there it might be blogs it might be articles uh might be newspaper articles well I think you know and it's a great question and I think with grey literature it's a question of when you set out your protocol and eligibility criteria, whether you say that you're going to include grey literature and what grey literature you might include. I mean, my view on it would be that, um, well, the more grey literature you want to find, the harder it becomes to search for it. So the kind of standard search engines like PsychInfo will, will, they might have a little bit of the grey literature, but essentially it's going to be mainly research papers. So you're kind of a little bit of a hostage fortune, I think that's the right saying, uh, if you try and find every single bit of grey literature on something. And you always want to do things systematically and comprehensively. So it's better to say, I'm going to exclude the grey literature um, than, than do it kind of a bit piecemeal. But, you know, having said that, it, there's a lot of theses out there, for instance, which are now accessible and you can download, which may be really relevant to the questions you're asking. So I would be reluctant, I certainly if I was doing a search on anything, I would never exclude the thesis because the doctoral level thesis, master's thesis are often done in a very rigorous way. Um, I guess if you're doing something that's empirical, then probably it's you, you don't need to look so much at kind of newspaper um, and, and, and kind of maybe journal piece, sorry, um, kind of magazine articles because they're less likely to be empirical. And they are hard to find but i think typically people would search for thesis um there's no you know there's no right or wrong answer but it's about being explicit but i think you, you would be hard pushed to exclude thesis yes well, i think i think again that's a really comprehensive answer um another question from fleur vickery um what are your thoughts on using thematic or narrative analysis thematic on or thematic or uh, thematic or narrative analysis? Yeah, I mean, the terms are used in slightly different ways. I don't think there's any kind of hard and fast definitions. And I think that kind of the, it, it's a bit of an emerging field. So thematic analysis, I mean, thematic analysis is a, well, there's different meanings of it. So thematic analysis generally can mean just looking for themes as I was discussing that within a literature review, you would look at themes. 
uh, and you can call that thematic analysis. There is also thematic analysis, which uh, Brown and Clark is a particular methodology uh, that has been developed. Now, I'm not sure, I might be wrong here, I'm not sure if they've written about the use of that or the, it's been written about the use of that for literature reviews. Uh, it tends to be mainly for primary data, but um, certainly you could use those principles uh, of thematic analysis for um, a, a literature review. But whether you'd want to reference Brown and Clark, uh, I'm not totally sure. I mean, uh, you know, it is a thematic analysis. You're looking for themes, but I'm sure if there isn't already, there will be people writing about kind of thematic analysis in literature. And I may not just be that familiar with that. In terms of narrative analysis, um, and again, my understanding, and I might be wrong here, but um, and John McLeod, my colleague John, knows this area much better than I do. Uh, and he's written about his book doing counseling research. He's kind of a classic on, uh, and has chapters on uh, reviews, which is very good for the reading. But my understanding of narrative analysis is that, it, <laughs> sorry, narrative analysis is, is that it can have um, kind of different meanings from a kind of, again, it can be a kind of formal, method of analysis uh, where you are kind of looking at the narratives and analyzing the narratives in people's speech uh, and people's talk uh, in a kind of um, yeah looking for the story um, two more people do use it kind of literature reviews and talk about kind of narrative analysis and literature review and what they kind of mean there is is the opposite to maybe a meta analysis which is more quantitative narrative analysis is, is is kind of writing the story of the data which can be a thematic analysis so it, so i kind of in literary reviews i kind of think of narrative analysis and thematic analysis as pretty close to each other but um don't quote me on that um you know it's worth looking into the more specifically at literature on that oh well, i think that again another comprehensive answer and a, a final question from emma foley similar question to fleur's question thoughts on whether ipa and narrative analysis hmm can complement each other well um i don't know if you could so so in terms of literature reviews generally could you do an ipa so ipa is interpretive phenomenological anal analysis developed by jonathan smith and colleagues and it's a very widely used method of um qualitative analysis uh where you kind of look at people's stories and then you kind of analyze across different cases and looking at their experiences and meaning. And there's a kind of, so you're looking at both their interpretation of their experiences and then how you interpret their experiences. Now, I've never seen anyone use IPA for a literature review, but that's not to say again that that doesn't happen. And I think that, that, that'd be a great question for Jonathan Smith, actually. And um, I, imagine, I imagine you could do it in an IPA style in the sense that you'd be looking at the kind of different stories in the different papers and then kind of bringing them together. Whether that would actually be formal IPA or not, I'm not sure. I think certainly in terms of method, um, you know, uh, you know, the a narrative, as I said before, I think a kind of a lot of systematic reviews are effectively some kind of what's called narrative analysis in the sense that somebody is telling that story. And I think whether in kind of primary analysis, you can use IPA and narrative analysis, you probably could do something that combines them. Although if you're working at kind of master's level or certainly graduate level, I would be inclined to just kind of stick to one method rather than making it too complicated. And IPA is a great method uh, for research. Narrative analysis is also a really helpful method. You know, thematic analysis, but I would tend to stick to one rather than combining them. But as I say, you know, these are really interesting the last couple of questions about could you apply these to literature reviews? And uh, my honest answer is I haven't seen people do that, but it may well be doable and very interesting to do. Yes, and, and just finally, as we hit the top of the hour, Emma has, has qualified her question by saying, sorry, my question is more about when conducting research slash analysing findings rather than literature review. So it may not be a relevant question for today. <laughs> we'll save that for another time, Rory. Yes. Great so, question, though. Yes. I mean, I, I just want to thank you again, Mick, for joining us. Um, it's been really, really enlightening. So, so helpful in terms of um, literature reviews. 
Um, for those watching on YouTube, of course, we're going to put Nick's blog in the comments bar when this is published, so you can go and have a look at the material he was referencing. And all it, all it goes for me to finally say to you, Mick Cooper, thank you so much for joining us. Thanks, Roy. It's lovely being here. Good luck, everyone, with your research. See you later. <laughs>